Hello. It's been a hot minute. The hottest of minutes, actually. It's been over a year since I posted on YouTube, and that was after my last video sort of teased that I was gonna do something spectacular for my next video. Well, it's been a year, and I still haven't finished that concept at all. I would still like to create economics for writers videos because I think that there is valuable information there, but I don't want to be so overwhelmed by the density of those projects that it keeps me from creating entirely. So I still do want to stay focused sort of in the realm of writing and world building. I'm going to jump in with something a little more lighthearted. Is it a bad thing to jump on a trend years later and do it to practice creating content? Possibly. I thought it would be really, really fun if I found Onision's terrible novels and I read them to you and gave you my perspective as a world builder as an economist, as a writer, or just somebody who's watched a ton of commentary channels. Anyway, I thought I would read a little bit of Reaper's Creek to you. Without further ado, um, let's dive in. Before you read this book, I want you to understand something. All of my books, Stones to Abigail, This is Why I Hate You, and now Reaper's Creek, they are not works of pure fiction. These are stories from my own life mixed in with my imagination. I mean, most authors are so arrogant in that they assume that what they are writing will be communicated as a mixture of personal experience and fiction. But just because we all know the age-old rule, write what you know, doesn't mean that everyone else knows that. So <laughs> Onision, thanks for that clarification, because the rest of us writers are just arrogant bastards who don't clarify that. The question is distinguishing not what is real and what is fiction, but what is perceived as real to him and what is perceived as a work of his imagination. Many of the things told in these stories reflect on who I really was, what actually happened, and what was going on in my mind. I'd like to point out here that it's an and sign. Like, write out the word and. Stones to Abigail represented the better version of myself. Many of the events in that book happened in real life as well. This is why I hate you represented the darker version of myself. I can't. Various aspects of that book were derived from my actual life too. But this book, this one, is simply myself. Who I was, both good and bad during the time that this story takes place. As you read, I'll leave it up to you to decide what events really happened and what is a product of creativity. Well, um, call me crazy. <laughs> um, the magic system in this book happened in real life. Here's the thing. In my writing process, I am a prolific overwriter. I over describe things. I go way too much into the characters' heads to spill out everything that they're feeling. And in my editing process, I then cut things out. Now, the problem with being an overwriter is that sometimes you do form kind of an emotional connection to the things that you've been writing. You don't want to cut them out, but you really do need to cut them out to make the writing better. One example of this is that for years I had been using a prologue in one of my stories and I felt a deep personal connection to it because it was supposed to tie in events that happened later in the book. But recently I have replaced the prologue with something else, something that is probably more exciting anyway. And in doing so, I did feel a bit of liberation, not just for me, but for my potential readers, because I wasn't going to hold their hand in explaining what the story is about in the prologue. The story is gonna tell you what the story's about. This is the kind of writing that like has really irked me over the past few years, just because it's the kind of writing that in the editing process, I would sometimes come across it and I would be like, ugh, get rid of it, it's superfluous. But then he puts it in there and he's like, it's a stroke of genius that I mention that some of the things in the story are real and some of them are fake. And that makes a fantasy. 
chapter one. This says, Welcome to the Creek. Before we get into the actual meat of the story, the opening of a book is very, very important. If you do not open up with a good pace, you're not going to get your readers on board. And that doesn't mean that you have to open in medias res in the middle of things. It just means that you have to hook your readers and give them something interesting to chew on. You don't have to give them the full meal to start with. Give them an appetizer. I was home, finally. My father had taken me so many places when I was in Ohio. He bought me so many things, but maybe that was just to make up for the missing child support payments. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I apologize. Everyone seems so worried about what their ex would do with their money, as if they are a completely different person than who they originally fell in love with. What made you trust them in the first place? Why did your trust suddenly go away just because my mom left you? I'm going to say this isn't a terrible opening. The main character just came home from visiting his father in Ohio, and look, I'm from the Midwest. I don't know many places that you could go in Ohio, but... It's not a terrible opening to the story, but I think that, knowing what I know about the story, it's the wrong opening for the story. To me, it makes it seem like this is a story about a child who is caught between their parents and sort of struggling between the mom's impression of the father and potentially their own love for their father, which would be a very interesting premise for a story. But let's keep reading and see if that's what's going to happen. If this is really a story about a child of divorced parents. I couldn't hear much of anything over the furnace blasting in my ears, the tiny window at the base of the bed. My stepdad built me, allowed a subtle glow of light to peer in. I crawled over to the window to see my sister Joanna playing outside with our geese. She was happy to be home as well. Okay, so I take it they got home the day before, but you know. Also, playing with geese? Boy, no! No, do not play with geese. Those things are mean. You don't play with geese. What is wrong with you? Summer this year was strange. There was a girl there. When I looked at her, it felt like she was staring right through me. She had curly brown hair. Her parents were both from Latin America. She was so cute. She was my favorite part of church every Saturday. Wait, and the uh, entire state of... Oh, okay, okay. I, was, I thought he was talking about Joanna. Okay, so... Here's the thing, if you are talking about one character in one paragraph and then you immediately start talking about something else in the next, you're going to confuse your readers. I thought that he was talking about Joanna. Well, let's keep going. She was my favorite part of church every Sunday and the entire state of Ohio itself. At this point, she is my main reason to return next summer as I have no idea what to do with my father. Joanna just says, Ditto, whenever she talks to my dad on the phone, after he says he loves her. I wonder if he has caught on to the fact that she says that because of the things my mom told her about her biological father. Things I think might be true. At least now it's circling back in a way where it's referencing the things that we are assuming the story is about. But going from this girl to... Joanna again, it's confusing, man. I will have to say, like, so far, like, the writing isn't terrible. I'm not completely caught off guard by it. The story still needs a lot of structural editing, and I'm only on paragraph three. I climbed down my bed, hanging by chairs over my water heater, washer, and dryer. Use the actual word and, please. That's right. I live in an eight by six box. It sits by the kitchen in my 900 square foot home, but it's paradise here. When I'm at my dad's house, I feel like I'm in some kind kind of cookie cutter Christian bubble cult. Everyone is smiles. Everyone is doing R. This has to be missing something because it goes everyone is smiles. Everyone is doing R. I see them showing off their pearly ivory teeth every time they see me. They're hiding from themselves. They're still breaking many of the fragile people they encounter and smiling just the same. Are people from Ohio like this? I had a roommate from Ohio once and she wasn't cookie cutter. She did have a nice smile. I presume that he's just talking about this very Christian town and the people that his father surrounds him with when he's in this very Christian town. It's jarring to jump from the setting to the comparison 
of his father's house. I think that if it turns out that this character does eventually go back to his father's house, it would make for a much more interesting way of presenting these details if he first described what his own house was like in a very positive light. And then eventually once we get to this cookie cutter Christian cult bubble town, we then are looking at it through a very cynical light. So we have this cozy, cramped, maybe kind of run down space that the character very much enjoys and then we have a space that is very different but also knowing what I know about the story maybe we don't need these details in there because they don't pertain to the story and look I am not the kind of person who thinks that you have to have everything relate to the plot, but everything should enrich the story. This doesn't enrich the story at all from what I've seen about the book. Jeez. Walking outside, my stepdad is working on making another bed with his bare hands. Just like the bed he made me, the bed that somehow allowed me to exist with my own space in such an unlikely place. Where would I be going to bed without the contraption he made me? In the bathroom? Or maybe we'd just put a hang... We'd just put hang a blanket from the ceiling in our little wooden front room. I wouldn't call a bed a contraption so much as I would call it furniture. Hi, Papa. I'm not that funny. I just think I'm really funny. Hi, Papa. I said as my stepdad chipped away. He looked up with his goofy mustache bending to his smile. Okay, that's playful. I'll give it that. Hey there, Greg. I'm making this bed for your cousin Rod. I smiled and replied, oh, cool, and thought about what he was getting out of it. My stepdad had so much time on his hands. Maybe he was putting food on the table, or maybe he was just trying to be everyone's friend. The problem with friends is that they aren't bound to you by blood. There is no promise they will never go away. Sometimes I feel like my real friends are the woods that surround my house, the creek that runs by it. They don't leave me. They don't lie to me. They tell me who they are, and they never change. It started out as a conversation with a stepdad and then just slaps you in the face with the trees are my friends. So is the nasty river water. Maybe my stepppapa would be happier if he was also friends with the trees as opposed to making furniture for our family. But that's the problem with friends. They're not your family. They're not bound to you by blood like the trees. The trees are bound to us by blood. Hey, dork, belted my sister, who is no longer playing with the geese. Good. She shouldn't be playing with geese. Oh, hi, Joanna. What are you doing? I said with a smirk. Okay. Oh, hi, Joanna. What are you doing? I said with a smirk. She replied, none of your business, loser. This was typical. Joanna being irrational. Why did she say hi to me if she did not want to talk? Oh, right. To call me a dork and move on. It's actually self-aware, at least. You know, Onision was self-aware enough to mention that that conversation had no purpose whatsoever, but not enough to remove it. But, you know, he could try editing sometime and that would, that would do something for him. One of the things I would like to point out too is that whenever there are these sections of conversation, it's all in one paragraph. So we're gonna go over that really quick. We're just gonna divert a little bit so that you all know there's no way any of us know this because we've none been through the third grade. Here are some common reasons for starting a new paragraph. Something changes or a new topic is introduced. Time or location changes. A character enters a scene. Dialogue break up a lengthy speech or monologue, including interior monologues, and to create emphasis. Those are some good pieces of advice. And honestly, where you break a paragraph in your writing, it's not totally subjective, but it is to some extent subjective. So I could understand if this is all a creative choice. The thing is, is that before you can learn how to creatively break rules, you need to know how to first use them, which is why in the third grade, you do have to follow writing rules to a T. And then later on, once you start 
creating your own writing voice, you start to experiment a little bit with the rules and you start to bend them a little bit, but you bend them in ways that you still kind of respect the rules. Maybe Onision is a genius by not breaking up these segments of dialogue. I'm inclined to believe that he just doesn't know how writing works. Bold assumption, I'm sorry. Let's get back into the story. I wanted to go up the trail to swing alone, but I felt a familiar wet dew on my feet. Of course, I wasn't wearing any socks or shoes yet. Hey Daniel, want to help me out over here? My stepdad was trying to insert a section of the bed onto a supporting pole, but the teeth of the headboard kept wobbling around, making it a two-man job. I'll be here all day if I just keep like picking apart like the paragraph structures, but okay, that's okay. My stepdad was a tall man, maybe six foot one inches. He had a haircut like he was in the Beatles band, but the caterpillar above his lip threw the look off. I always admired how healthy he looked because most everyone else his age looked like they were well on their way to getting diabetes. Didn't all the Beatles have mustaches at one point? I'm sure that was the case. Gotta go grab shoes one second, he replied with a dad-like frustrated but friendly voice. I'm sure that there are sections. There, there have to be sections in this thing. Gotta go grab shoes one second, he replied with a dad-like frustrated but friendly voice. All right then. Okay, I'll, I'll get into this formatting a little bit. When you follow up a piece of dialogue with a lowercase letter, generally whoever is being referenced in that section is going to be the person who spoke. But clearly, <sighs> capitalization doesn't have any hard and fast rules. Slipping on some shoes inside, I ran back out and pushed the teeth of the headboard in the associated slot so he could firmly put the side of the headboard into the supporting beam. My dad said, thanks buddy. I'll let you know if I need more help. The baseboard should be no problem, as it's shorter, though. I laughed and hugged him. I'm going up the hill, Papa, I said. He replied, okay, kid. Running up the hill, I got hit by a lot of stickers. Those are plants that basically get stuck to your clothes by hooking them with their sharp prongs or by otherwise having a natural adhesive on them. I didn't really worry about the stickers at this point, however. It was the nettles I was afraid of. Those push little needles in your skin and cause pretty significant pain. Oddly enough, if you boil them, apparently they make a decent soup. But make no mistake, they are basically the jellyfish of plants. Here's another paragraph about the stickers, okay? Getting past all the stickers, I was finally to it. The tree. The massive beautiful tree with a rope hanging down just at the right length so you could swing on it without smacking your body into any of the nearby trees. How do I phrase this without losing my mind? This screams first draft to me. So what I had mentioned before was that I am a prolific overwriter and that I over explain a lot of things and in the editing process I do have to go back and revise but that doesn't mean I do it with everything, there are sometimes I find that I skim through some details that should probably be expanded upon, but I'm far more likely to add more detail than necessary. It's very, very common for writers in their first drafts to over explain some things and then just not go into a lot of detail in others. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that the point of first draft is to get this story onto the page. It doesn't matter if it's coherent. It doesn't matter if it's grammatically correct. It doesn't matter if you don't have all the details you need or if you change some details later on in the story, like your main character has blonde hair at the beginning and then she has red hair later on. Like that doesn't matter. The point of the first draft is to get the story onto the page. The reason why this screams first draft at me is because he went into excruciating detail explaining how to put a bed together and still managed to then ramble on about these freaking nettles, but still not actually give us a scene, a scene of this boy running up the hill and he notices that the nettles are getting on his clothes, but he keeps running. And then once he's at the top of the hill, he's so elated by the sight 
of the tree that he ignores the stickers completely. And I think that that would then speak to sort of the whimsy of a child. They go in, they don't mind if they're dirty or sticky or gross in any way, shape or form. What he's doing is he's demonstrating that he's fairly one track minded. The inconsistency of description is what makes this feel very first drafty to me. Climbing up to the black and yellow twisted rope, I grabbed on and began to swing around. Woohoo! I screamed almost every time. I was so happy to finally be at the place I belonged. It didn't matter I was wearing my pajamas still. It didn't matter that I was wearing a t-shirt supporting a non-Christian TV show. I wasn't at my biological dad's anymore. I was alone in the woods. I was free. More nitpicking here. Why would you say it's a non-Christian TV show and then not give the TV show? Just make up a TV show for the story. It, it, it's just more in the character of a child that way. Even if I was writing something recalling my childhood, I might add in like wearing Wizards of Waverly Place t-shirt that was seen as non-Christian even, like sure, that's fine. But I wouldn't exclude the show because the show itself is what was the problem, is it not? I don't know. Suddenly I saw the face of my bully show up in front of my eyes. It was Philip. And immediately after, everything went black. I see the end of the chapter. I felt a small amount of blood dripping down my stomach. My eyes were closed. Without opening my eyes, I rolled backwards onto my back. I opened my eyes and saw only trees above me. I was still outside, in the woods, alone. The birds were chirping, the sun rays were peeking through the leaves, and pine. The air was... Oh, f it's not the end of the chapter. It's just a weird break. Again, something's missing here. Something has to be missing here, because I scrolled through and the air was minding their own business. Everything was right where it should be, except for me. What happened? Looking down, I could see the white t-shirt I was wearing now had a hole in it and a blood splot. I thought that your t-shirt was for a TV show. A nondescript, non-Christian TV show. Make up your mind. This is making me stupider. I'd fallen off the rope swing after I fainted. Why did I see Philip's face? Wait, what? He was on the rope swing and Philip's face appeared in front of him and then everything just went black. And now he's on the ground after having fallen off the rope swing and he's got blood on his nondescript, non-Christian TV show t-shirt that's white. Okay, okay. Walking down the hill and into the yard, Joanna said with her basic brown teenager haircut and clothes that were too tight for her plump body type, Oh my god, dork, are you gonna die or something? I replied, yes, Joanna, I'm going to die. Don't come to my funeral. You would somehow make it suck even more. Joanna yelled back a fake laugh. As I walked into the house, she had nothing else to say. Freaking weird. Why is her basic brown teenager haircut talking to him. I've heard that Onision is like really a dick about appearances, particularly women's appearances, but like clearly he's got a thing with fat people because he first commended the stepfather for not being fat. And then now he's like shitting on the sister because she is fat, plump, like, you know what? I'll give him this. I have uninvited my siblings to my funeral before. It's just something we do. My mom's uninvited me to her funeral before. Not because I ticked her off, but because I annoyed her. The sort of like dark humor between siblings, I will, I'll give him that. Like that's a thing. At least it is in my family. I said that and now immediately like I feel really gross comparing my family to Onision's work of fiction. Stepping across the wood floor, my mom painted white as a result of our pets peeing on our former carpet till it was unbearable to have around. I walked into the bathroom, now putting pressure on my wound. I took off my shirt, his nondescript white non-Christian TV show shirt, and threw it in the tiny trash bin. Oh no, not your nondescript non-Christian white t-shirt. It's the best shirt ever. Looking into the bathroom mirror, I gazed at my own face. Same Daniel as always. Who's Daniel? I thought his name was Greg. Maybe, maybe Daniel is the name of his reflection. I think that's cool. Yeah, a kid, a kid could name their reflection something different than themselves. Like, you know, 
I was a weird kid and I didn't do it, but kids could do that. Sharp jawline, acne on my face, bushy eyebrows, and abnormally tall for an 11 year old. Okay. The bushy eyebrows thing, I can, I can relate to that. I've always had very thick eyebrows until I got a hold of a tweezers. Kids can have really bushy eyebrows. I keep distracting myself from this because it sucks. Looking down, I could see my wound. It was actually incredibly superficial. Maybe the sharp stick I had fallen on when I blacked out had hit a rib. I imagine if I was hit somewhere else, it would have at least dug deeper. Boy, you're now telling us that you were aware that you had fallen on a stick? See, this is why you have to edit things. Had he reread this story, he would have noticed at this part Hey, it would make a lot of sense to, instead of just randomly mentioning after the main character goes to the bathroom, lifts up his shirt and looks at his wound, that he probably would have noticed a stick. Okay. Time for my favorite part, pouring hydrogen peroxide on my wound and watching the science project explode in front of me. Child, if you... Hydrogen peroxide is making your blood explode. You're gonna die. Like, I don't know what's in your blood, but it sounds toxic. I felt like I had enough outdoors for that day. It was time to retire to my bedroom and play video games the rest of the day. My game of choice, Metal Gear Solid. Okay, so you can name a freaking video game but not give a name to the nondescript, non-Christian TV show for which you love so much you have a t-shirt showcasing it. I'm like starting to go hoarse because reading this out loud is giving me throat cancer. <laughs> and I'm running out of water. My game of choice, Metal Gear Solid, a game that had been unwittingly programming my worldview, causing me to prematurely judge and reflect on aspects of our world I would not have considered till I was at least an adult without it. My mom gets home at five o'clock. Okay, so this is definitely missing some stuff because it just said mom gets home at five o'clock and it ends, and then it's the next ch next chapter. This is taking years off my life. To recap the first chapter, we have this child, Greg, who has a reflection named Daniel, and he is decidedly non-Christian, and he just got home from visiting his father in Ohio. Look, I get using the first chapter to set up like the setting of the story, but what the fuck is this? It both got in to way too much detail and not enough. Like I know so much about the comparison between stickers and jellyfish, and yet I don't know what this story is supposed to be about by just reading that. At first I was under the impression that it was going to be about a child of divorced parents and offering his perspective on life. Now I'm not so sure. Uh, 